Hey guys, thanks for joining me today on The Onion Peel. I just wanted to take a moment at the beginning of this episode to again issue a content warning. We will be discussing suicide. If this topic makes you uncomfortable or could be a possible trigger, please listen accordingly and maybe come back and join us another time. Welcome to The Onion Peel, a show where we get real, raw, and honest about life. It's a space where authenticity lives and hope resides. The Onion Peel is a place where we peel back the layers of our stories and discover the unexpected flavoring that each one brings. Hey guys, I'm your host and semi-crazy Christian, Angela McConnell. I'm a middle-aged mom of five with a dead husband, and I've been through some shit in my life. Now, I'm on a mission, a mission to bring hope to the world. So join me as we journey through this onion and find hope in the tears. You ready to peel this thing? Hey, y'all. It's the onion peel time. Thanks for joining me. I hope you had a chance to get to know my Don a little bit. I thought today that I would kind of pick up after the funeral. I would say that the immediate time after the funeral was really when you're stepping into your new reality. Because that week that it happens... And all the chaos ensues. I mean, the chaos continued for so long, but it's major chaos when you have sudden death and then you put suicide on top of it. And then you have to worry about, you know, just getting the service prepared, getting the body prepared, just all that immediate death stuff. And once that's over is really in a way when you start free falling off the cliff. You're sort of at the edge during that week of craziness when the event happens. And then you step off and you just free fall into the abyss. Because now you have to truly start to face your reality. And your mind isn't even close to being able to do that. I always used to say that I would walk around in my robot self. It's funny, I never really realized how much part of me is actually just behaviors and mannerisms that are so automatic that you think they're just part of you, but in a way they're like a part of you that you don't even really know can be separated. It's like people would ask me questions and I would answer in my normal Angela McConnell way, but my inside soul was like, I don't want to say that. Why am I saying that so bright and kind of even upbeat? I don't understand. That's not how I feel. Why am I talking that way? And it's because when somebody says, for example, how are you getting along? You know, your natural response when people ask you those types of questions are, yeah, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm doing pretty good. Or, oh, yeah, things are great. We don't even think about the response. We just go into our robot behaviors, our robot speech with tone and facial expression and everything else. And I think it's interesting to point this out because whenever you hear of somebody that has some kind of a loss or tragic event or whatever it is. We'll be talking, asking how the person is. And a lot of times you get back, you know, I talked to her and she's actually doing pretty good considering. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's all a bunch of crap. That person that's going through whatever they're going through, they're in their robot mode. They are simply answering the questions not connected to what they're actually saying. Because it's so a part of who they are, those mannerisms, 
that it just comes out that way, at least initially while they're in that heavy loss period or that shock period. Eventually, things change and they find a different level, but that can last months and months, actually, where you can say it's a mask, but I'm going to say it's deeper than a mask. All I can tell you is I just didn't realize there was so much a part of my personality of how I exist in this world that is just coined speech and robotic-like mannerisms because that's just the way that I've always spoken. It was very out of body for me because I knew that I was responding in a way when people were asking me things that I didn't necessarily feel. It was just an eye-opener. So right after the funeral, we had a lot of people want to come and visit, which was really great. I had a lot of food. We had a giant cooler that we just put on the porch, and people would come and leave food for it, which was really great. We had that for months, people signing up for food, and that was awesome. I had people that came over to the house. And it's interesting because you don't know who you want over and who you don't want over. You also get in this place where you feel like if you tell somebody no, that you're going to hurt their feelings and you don't want to do that. And then you just end up feeling even more burdened and upset and more weight on your shoulders than you did to begin with before this whole thing happened. So people would come over, and I learned very quickly that this was not going to work for me, not even for a second. Because people, when it comes to suicide, I think when it comes to death in general, but especially when it comes to suicide, people, they A, don't know what to say, and B, the things they do say, Oh, dear God, help us. And there's so much curiosity around suicide because it's such a hard thing for anybody's brain to wrap around. And so when people would come and they'd tell me things like, well, I know there's no life insurance because when you commit suicide, that nulls the policy out, which actually is false, just in case anybody wants to know out there. Most life insurance policies, there's a two-year contestability period which means if you take out a life insurance policy on yourself and then you kill yourself within two years, correct, there would be no life insurance. But as long as you make it past that two years, you're good to go. The policy pays out. And I understand that when people would talk to me, they're just trying to figure out maybe a way to help because everybody pretty much knew that I was financially wiped out. But after having a couple people over and just feeling very unsafe when that happened and feeling very uncomfortable with the questions that people were asking me, I basically just started to close the doors and I'm like, nope, this can't happen. I need to protect myself. You know, the other thing I would add on to that, too, is that I think it also depends on what your personality type is. Some people, when they face a tragedy or they face a loss or a difficult time, they want people around them. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel hopeful. It makes them feel loved. Great. Wonderful. I am not that person. I never have been that person. And I knew that. But because you're in a tragic situation, you sort of think, well, maybe it would be better if I have people around. Thank God, within a couple days, I realized, yeah, no, that's not a good thing for me. Honestly, I just wanted everybody to get the hell away from me. I needed time to process. I needed time to breathe. I didn't want to answer anybody's questions. And again, people want to help you, but they don't know how to help you. And so when they try to help you, all they're doing for me in my situation was actually causing me more pain. So it's important to just recognize, to try to be aware amongst all the devastation that you're feeling, 
what is going to be good for you. What do you need? Because that's what's the most important. I would say the main focus directly after the funeral, especially for my family, was figuring out exactly how far in the hole I am financially. What is the final picture of where I am with money? And it was great to have the help, but it also damn near killed me, I'll be honest. Because here's what happened. There were so many questions up in the air. What's going on? How did we get here? Found out right away there was no life insurance. Found out that the business he had going had failed. All this other stuff. And layer after layer is being peeled back. And so you kind of had to go on a detective hunt. And as one piece of the puzzle got placed on the board, the picture almost became more confusing. And the desire to get those other puzzle pieces for my family members was obsessive, which is great. But in the middle of this intense grief, it was not always conducive. I had family members that just took over, started going through Don's wallet, went through his safety deposit box, you know, went and got all my bank statements, started going through all my checking account, just all my money transactions, and then presenting me with them like, should you be spending money on this? You know, why did you spend money on that? It was horrible. It was horrible. And then I think at one point they had found his class ring. They had decided, you know, what kid it was going to go to and just all these things. And it wasn't anything that was ill-intended. Please understand that. But it was so violating to me. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. It was like just feeling so exposed and and just treated like I didn't count or that I was dumb and stupid and unaware. I felt violated. I felt completely violated. I understand that was not anybody's intent. But at the time, whew, it was bad. And again, I'm going to stress that it also depends on your personality. I am somebody who likes to be in charge, and I like to have control over my shit. I mean, I just do. That's who I am. And so when somebody starts coming in and going through my husband's personal effects without talking to me and my personal items without talking to me, and I understand they were probably thinking, she's got so much going right now, I don't want to burden her, I'm just going to try and help solve this problem. I understand that. But when people come in and bulldoze their way in like that, for me and who I am, doesn't work. And it caused me a tremendous amount of additional pain. Because all I wanted to do at the time was protect Don. Why? Because he died from suicide. And suicide carries shame. The shame hits immediately. It hits your loved ones. It hits your friends immediately the second it happens. It's shame. And so all I wanted to do was protect Don. From day one, that's all I felt was I have to protect Don from the judgment that he is going to face now. That was my main thing. So when everybody started coming in and going through his personal stuff... I hated that because I was like, he's my husband. Get the hell away. He belongs to me. He belongs to me. He's mine. You want to get to him? Then you need to get to him through me because I'm his guardian. I'm his protector. And they weren't doing that. 
Nobody was doing that. And so I had no control. Little bit of information about who I am, if you can't tell already. I'm somebody that doesn't generally have a problem with laying down boundaries. It's just not something I have an issue with. I'm also not afraid to have confrontation. It's just part of who I am. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just part of me. So right away, I tried laying down some boundaries. I remember one of the things I specifically said was, I think this was to people that were close to me, that were like in my close circle, family, friends. I remember saying, look, y'all, I understand that you have to process what happened to Don and you have to grieve and you have everything that you personally have to go through with this for all kinds of reasons. I get that, but I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want you talking about that in front of me. I don't want you discussing that in front of me. Y'all have spouses, so you can go and grieve and vent amongst your spouses. I don't want to hear it. Because of the shame, I knew that people were going to be upset and angry. I knew the second that it happened, you could tell everybody wants an answer. And so if you can't get an answer, then guess what happens? Everybody starts looking for blame. We got to blame somebody. And who are we going to blame? Well, hell, we're going to blame the 57-year-old man that killed himself, aren't we? Because isn't he a son of a bitch for doing what he did to his family? How could he do that? Because that's what happens with suicide, guys. It's just, it's just the natural way that we think. We don't mean to, but it's just the way that we have been trained to think about suicide. And that needs to change. Period. Again, I just want to keep stressing, I understand that no one wanted to hurt me or hurt the kids, and that they were all hurting. I understand that. This is the reality of grief. This is the reality of suicide. This is what it is. At the time that this was happening, in the events after Don killed himself, This is what it was. And this is my dynamic of in my world of people. Perhaps somebody else's is different. This is in my my realm of the universe, of how the relationships interplayed with each other based on history, based on personalities, all that stuff. And it was ugly. So I put the line in the sand, but guess what happened? Everybody just walked right over the line. They didn't care because they were hurting so desperately. They were hurting for me. They were hurting for the kids. So they didn't care what I was saying because they had to figure stuff out and they had to find an answer to why this happened. And they had to somehow stop this pain for me, for the kids and for them. And that's admirable and it's wonderful. But it wasn't what I needed. And quite honestly, I didn't give a crap. Don't care. Because Don was my husband. He was the father to my children. And he was our every day. We just had our every day changed. Not our once a week. Not our two times a week phone call. Not our once a month visit. Not dinner every Thursday night. No. This was our every single waking moment day. And so when those boundaries kept getting crossed, I felt like I was just invisible and that nobody was listening to me because everybody was too busy trying to save me and the kids. It's such a weird place to be because of course I wanted help. Of course I was incapacitated with proper thinking and all those things, of course. It was a tough spot. It was such an incredible burden to place on family and friends. It was just a bad spot for all of us. 
Nobody knew what to do because everybody was hurting so badly. But my bottom line was, this is my life. This is my life, first and foremost. And I'm a 44-year-old mom. And I get to say what happens. Because I didn't get to say what happened when he died. So needless to say, there was a lot of tension with everyone. Family, close friends. There was a lot of tension for a long time. And it was difficult for all of us. At some point, you just have to make a choice as to what you need to do to survive. Because I knew deep down that I had to survive. Because if I did not survive, then my children were not going to survive. So, I decided that I needed to do something to take control back. I was, I think, at a place where I was just tired of everything happening to me. And I knew that, quite honestly, I didn't have any control over anything. I knew in the future I truly didn't have any control. So I remember I called my brother and I said, I need you to do something for me. And I don't want you to tell anybody. You can't tell mom. You can't tell dad. You can't tell anybody that I want to do this. Please remember that I'm in a place where everybody's in my grill right now. Watching what I say, what I do. And so I wanted to go out and do this thing. But I didn't want everybody to know. I just wanted something to my damn self. So my brother came over a couple days later, and he picked me up. We took off, and we went to the shooting range. Because I had told my brother that I wanted to shoot the gun that Don used to take his life. And the reason that I wanted to do that was because I was going to have the final say over that thing that ultimately had the power to end his life. As a Christian, I believe in God. Therefore, I believe that we have an enemy. And I was not going to have the enemy have the last say over that gun. I wanted to take that gun and I wanted to... I wanted to pray over that gun. I needed to have control over something. I needed to make a stand. And I think deep down now that I look back at it, I think that stand was way bigger. I think my stand needed to be to fight. And I was going to fight and not let the enemy ever win again. And so I think I needed to put my foot down For all the universe to see. The magnitude of what I needed to say in this moment was, you're not taking me down. I'm going to fight. And so, we pull up to the shooting range and I walk outside and put my earmuffs on, whatever you call them. And I picked up that gun. And I remember just holding it in my hands, thinking, this was it. This was the last thing my husband touched. It was so incredibly surreal to me. It was probably only maybe a month out after he had died. And I'm standing there with the gun in my hand that my husband took his life with. And so my brother said, you ready? You got this? I said, yep. So I held that gun up. I aimed it at the target. Took a breath. And I squeezed the trigger. And you want to know what? It was awesome. 
I wanted to do it again, so I did. And then I shot again, and then I shot again, and then I shot again. And it was exhilarating. Because I took control back of something. I don't know how many times I shot the gun that day. I mean, it wasn't a ton. I wasn't going there for target practice. I just wanted to just go and shoot it. And once I got done, I held the gun in my hand and I prayed over it. And I said, Lord, this gun was used for evil. And I'm asking you to use it for good. Because this gun can be used for good. It can be used for enjoyment. It can be used for protection if needed. But whoever this gun went to next, I wanted them to be blessed by it. I wanted it to go forward and I wanted it to be a blessing. And I was going to stand in that moment and flip that from bad to good. So I said my little prayer, put it back in the case, and got back in the car, and I went home. Is that a strange thing to do, what I did? Who would ever want to touch the gun that their person used to end their life? Well, I did. And you know what? It helped me. And I'm thankful for that moment. That moment gave me hope. That moment gave me courage. That moment was a stand against being a victim. Did I realize all those things right then and there? No. Consciously? No. Of course not. It's this deep down inside of you. What was it that pushed me to want to do this? What was it that said, hey, you know what? You should go shoot that gun. I mean, that's not a normal thought. But yet that was a thought I had. And that thought became actually then a desire. Enough to motivate me to leave my house. And I didn't leave my house for six weeks, at least, after Don died. And so when I do leave, I'm going to go and shoot the gun? All right. That's hope. That is what hope looks like. It shows up in all different ways. But that was hope. Could I have coined it as hope at the moment? Nope. Couldn't have coined it as hope at the moment. Nope. But it was. And now I can tell you looking back, it was beautiful. I'm so thankful I did that. It was so incredibly painful, but it was so beautiful. That pain was beautiful. It was so raw. It was so pure. And I was just in the middle of it, standing. And I didn't even know how I was standing, but I was standing. That's hope. That's God. So there was a moment of hope amongst all the feelings of not having control of anything because everybody was coming in and walking over boundaries and all the uncertainty of not knowing where I was going to be financially in the future, all the invasive questions from people, and amongst all the pain, there was the hope in a gun The very thing that looked like it took my hope away was the very thing that gave me hope back. The enemy wasn't going to be the victor in my story. I was going to reclaim my life. And I did that the moment I shot the gun. 
You see, hope is always there. It doesn't always show up in this pretty package with a bow on top. But I promise you, it's there. It's always there. And with that, guys, I think it's time to put this onion back in the bin until we talk again. And hey... If you're liking the show, do me a favor. Share it with someone. Or like me on Facebook. Or write a review on iTunes. Help me to spread this mission of hope. Thanks, guys. I truly hope you have an awesome day.